the Kremlin never missed a chance to proudly demonstrate the might of the Soviet Union with a military parade. In 1933, amid this national spectacle, one of the largest tanks ever to enter production rolled across the Red Square. Standing over 11 feet tall and 30 feet long, a new monster greeted the world. Once crippled by the loss of their most experienced engineers during the revolution, the industrial base inherited by the Bolsheviks was forced to restart from scratch. For years, they struggled to mass-produce modern technology until the Soviets finally showed off their newest creation to the public. With five turrets, three cannons, six machine guns, and a crew of twelve, the massive T-35 tank, a land battleship, stunned the Soviet crowds and foreign militaries once the word leaked out. T-35 driver Somalyakov Ivan Arostovich recalled his first encounter with the vehicle, saying, quote, Five turrets, barrels sticking out in different directions. You needed a special ladder to climb up it. And it was, well, so huge that words could not express it. Scary, even. And the crew, a whole soccer team. In the years following World War I, with minimal experience from the battlefield and limited knowledge to build upon, vehicle engineers were pioneering uncharted territory in tank design, laying the groundwork for what these new weapons could achieve and what they couldn't. By the early 1930s, Soviet strategists had mapped out the next stages of tank warfare. Like the British, the Red Army believed that massive, heavily armed, multi-turreted, slower tanks would go into battle, surrounded by more agile light tanks for support. This pairing mirrored the role of the large dreadnought battleships at sea and the smaller frigates and cruisers. During a battle, medium tanks would first break through enemy defenses, followed by the large vehicles storming in and annihilating everything around them with their massive firepower and seemingly unstoppable force, ending with a third mobile wave of even lighter models with machine guns that would sweep through to secure the area, aided by infantry support. The new Soviet heavy tank, also called a landship, was developed at the OKMO Design Bureau by NCS, reportedly strongly influenced by the design of the British Vickers Independent model. The T-35-2 prototype was just in time for the 1933 military parade, one of the proudest achievements of modern Soviet industrialization, according to Francis Pullum's Tank Encyclopedia. These models, more than tanks, were, quote, symbols of the new industrial and military strength that the USSR had gained over the previous decade. By then, OKMO leaders were already hard at work drawing up plans for the production version of the tank. Unbeknownst to them, war was looming too. When the T-35 heavy tank, believed to be an engineering marvel, began production at the Kharkov Locomotive and Tractor Works, it was soon apparent to the engineers that the model was a very complex machine to manufacture and operate. The high assembly cost further compounded these issues. At around 525,000 rubles, this price tag would be enough to build nearly 10 light to medium tanks. Both the driver and tank commander had extremely limited visibility from their stations, so coordinating the large crew while trying to shoot was challenging. Safety was another huge issue. With the exit hatches next to the gun turrets, they could easily get blocked if a turret lost mobility or was destroyed over the hatch. By 1936, complaints about the Soviet landship had reached a point where top brass pondered pulling the model altogether. Instead, engineers came up with a long list of changes, and vehicles produced from 1937 onwards were much more reliable. By the time production finished, at most 15 were ever built in a single year. Improvements were continuously being made throughout production, with virtually every aspect of the T-35's design, from radios to guns to armor, tweaked with each new factory batch. Some of the multiple tank variants produced had minor weapon alterations, with at least one reportedly featuring a powerful flamethrower instead of a gun. But its most urgent problem was its insufficient armor. While the original plan for Soviet tank strategy called for similar moves of naval battles, experiences gained through the Spanish Civil War, border fighting with the Japanese, and the Winter War with Finland demonstrated the power of new anti-tank artillery and the importance of mounting armor-supported infantry offensives. Attempts to increase armor thickness raised the tank's already massive weight from 49 to 54 tons, worsening the vehicle's Achilles heel, mobility. While the landship's 500 horsepower petrol engine could boost the tank to 18 miles per hour on the road, most of the Soviet Union still relied on dirt roads, where the model could only go 8 miles per hour. By this time, more advanced vehicles, with two turrets, thicker armor, and more powerful guns were in development with the Red Army, and faced with these superior machines, the T-35 was rendered obsolete, 
leading to the discontinuation of its production in 1939, with only 61 models built. But as the T-35 landships were beginning to be relegated to military tank schools, a critical world event would overrule this decision and send them to the front line, the invasion of the Soviet Union by Nazi Germany. The Great Patriotic War had begun, and whether the Soviets liked it or not, the T-35 would have to be sent to the front lines. When the Wehrmacht launched Operation Barbarossa in June 1941, the surprise attack caused staggering losses on disorganized Red Army ground and air forces. Determined to fight back, General Mikhail Kirpino ordered as many tanks as possible for the front lines. Reportedly, 3,400 tanks, organized in six Soviet mechanized corps, were sent to conduct a counterattack in the towns of Brody and Dubno. The resulting Battle of Brody would become the largest tank battle in history. In June, 48 T-35 tanks were assigned to the 67th and 68th Heavy Tank Regiments of the 34th Tank Division of the 8th Mechanized Corps. As such, the T-35s began a chaotic, week-long road trek over 500 miles long toward the front line, all while German aircraft subjected them to constant bombardment. From the get-go, the T-35 crews had communication issues, and the commanders were overwhelmed with one too many responsibilities, managing the massive tanks and their equally significant intricacies. To add fuel to the fire, the gearbox and transmissions could not withstand going at maximum speed for long, constantly breaking down and pushing back the arrival date to the front line. Over half of the 48 landships suffered mechanical breakdowns on the road and were abandoned. Eight more had to be ditched because routine repairs became too difficult. The T-35's excessive tonnage also contributed to four more losses. Two got bogged down in a swamp and had to be left behind, while two fell while passing through a bridge breaking them. Records suggest that only 10 models arrived in Brody to face the Germans. In the once quiet Brody, the landscape quickly transformed into a tumultuous theater of war, where more than 3,000 Soviet and 1,000 German tanks fought against each other. Amidst this chaos, around June 30th, German and Soviet records confirm that a few T-35s engaged in their first actual combat. Joined by other tanks, the Soviet group managed to drive elements of the 16th Panzer Division out of the town of Berba on the outskirts of Brody, knocking out two Panzer III G tanks. However, as the Soviets continued their advance, four of the T-35s were destroyed by a mix of shell attacks and air offensives. In the confusion of the retreats and the border fighting, only a single account of the T-35's performance remains. That day, Front turret gunner V. Sazanov was part of the tank group that included four T-35s sent to reinforce other units. The crew initially fired across a river at Sitna, a small settlement, supporting their infantry. However, while en route, German fire intensified, and their advance was met with cannon fire from the left. While attempting to locate the source, Sazanov found the turret he managed suddenly struck. Under relentless gunfire, hitting them at five-second intervals, visibility was limited and the tank sustained hits from multiple directions. Everything was breaking down inside the vehicle. The chaos continued as their tank's track broke, only 150 feet from the hamlet. Despite their best attempts to counterattack, the tank's engine stalled, and one of the guns jammed. Once they spotted the enemy, he recalled, quote, Then we saw German soldiers and knew it was time to skedaddle out of there. We exited the turret and jumped down to the road from the turret. Of the T-35 crews, only four men survived. Despite numerical superiority, the Red Army struggled, partly due to inadequate training and poor leadership, exacerbated by German aerial dominance, and the Battle of Brody saw heavy losses, approximately a thousand Soviet and 300 German tanks. Surprisingly, German forces were alarmed by the resilience of Soviet T-34, KV-1, and KV-2 tanks against their weaponry. However, the Soviets had limited numbers of these models partly due to the massive resources allocated to building the larger-than-life landships. The last recorded action of the T-35 heavy tank took place during the First Battle of Kharkov. In the fall of 1941, German forces, eager to seize the city's vital industrial heart, clashed fiercely with Red Army troops, vehemently determined to defend their city's critical infrastructure. For the fight, four T-35 tanks, undergoing repairs at their home factory, were made roadworthy, rearmed, and hastily pressed into service. But once again, these mighty machines proved too big for the fight, and at least one, serial number 71562, was captured by the Wehrmacht and shipped to Germany for evaluation at the Kummersdorf Military Proving Ground and Museum. Time marched on, 
and by April 1945, the war's tide turned dramatically. The Soviet troops closed on Berlin, a lonesome land ship, now stripped of most of its armament and rendered immobile, was assigned to Panzer Brigade 150, tasked with defending the town of Zossen. As the Allied armies narrowed in on the German city, the Wehrmacht did everything in its power to protect its holdings and citizens, including ransacking their museums. However, with no use for the T-35 as a functional tank, the Panzer Brigade towed it into Zossen, where the Soviet Leviathan was used as a fixed fortification and barricade. On the 22nd, Soviet forces overran the town and encountered this familiar giant. The Soviet Russians then reclaimed the land battleship from the barricade, and with this, serial number 71562 was present for both the first and very last acts of the war. Overall, the five turret tanks proved to be a dead end in tank development. There was nothing one oversized and overgunned tank could do that ten much cheaper armored vehicles couldn't do better and faster. However, the T-35, featured on posters, medals, and propaganda even after its cancellation, was consigned to history, fighting for the motherland as a symbol, forever etched as a powerful visual metaphor of Soviet might.